everyone thank you for joining uh, we'll give this another two minutes and uh, start at about 3 p.m Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, we still have people joining us online, but we will get started with this. And as people join, they can catch up with the discussions. Uh, thank you for joining the webinar on understanding nature-based solutions for resilient infrastructure, co-hosted by the United Nations Environment Program and the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. I am Suchi Smita Mukhopadhyay, uh, Lead Specialist Advocacy at CDRI, and on behalf of CDRI, and UNEP, I welcome everyone for the first dialogue of the three-part learning series on implementing nature-based solutions for resilient infrastructure. Nature-based infrastructure or nature-based solutions for resilient infrastructure demonstrate the possibilities of harnessing nature to provide infrastructure services that are people-centered and have benefits for economy and the environment alike. NBS for infrastructure includes naturally occurring ecosystems such as forests, mangroves, wetlands, grasslands, as well as hybrid infrastructure, um, combining engineered or grain structures with nature-based solutions, such as rain gardens, green roofs, sustainable urban drainage systems, etc. As an important tool for enabling climate and disaster resilience of infrastructure, MBS can augment both climate mitigation and adaptation efforts, along with multiple core benefits in terms of improving air and water quality, enhancing green cover, biodiversity, and also creating healthy and sustainable living spaces. It has the potential to complement, substitute, or safeguard traditional grain infrastructure systems, especially in the context of addressing the multidimensional challenge of closing the infrastructure gap while concurrently strengthening disaster and climate resilience and ensuring carbon neutrality. Mainstreaming NBS in disaster and climate resilient infrastructure development would require scientific and evidence-based approaches to effectively assess the economic, environmental, and social benefits. Through this dialogue series, we will try to answer questions such as the role of NBS in bridging the infrastructure gap, how can NBS complement or safeguard grey infrastructure, how does nature-based infrastructure perform compared to grey infrastructure, and how will investments eventually shift from built environment to nature? Um, I will take a small pause here and request the participants to answer a few questions that will help assess the learning outcomes of this webinar. May I request our UNEP, UNEP colleagues to kindly share the link on the chat. Um, there's a short questionnaire that is available for the participants to answer. The link is right there and it will be available for the next 15 minutes or so. And we request participants who are uh, keen to get a certificate and have their learning outcomes assessed to kindly take this questionnaire for the, in the next 15 minutes. And as the participants attempt the questions, um, I will take this opportunity to introduce uh, the distinguished experts joining us here today to share knowledge, insights, and case studies 
to help understand the concept of NPS for infrastructure and its practical applications on the ground. We have with us today Mr. Amit Prothi, uh, the Director General of the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, CDRI. We have Ms. Emily Corwin, Director of Nature-Based Engineering Solutions, Conservation uh, International. We have Ms. Katharina Zushilo, Human Settlements and Infrastructure Senior Specialist from the GCF. We have Mr. DK Nag, um, the Environment Engineer from Himachal Pradesh Public Works Department, uh, India. We have Ms. Faptil Saxena, Research Associate of, of the UNDP, working on the convent with CDRI. We have Ms. Neha Kurian, Consultant DRR with the UNEP. And we have Ms. Saida Gohari, Senior Technical Advisor, Eco DRR Disasters and Conflicts at the UNEP. I will start with Mr. Amit Prothi, who is an international expert with nearly 25 years of progressive leadership in the field of urban planning and resilient infrastructure. He has managed multidisciplinary teams on thematic topics that relate to climate change mitigation and adaptation, including environmental planning, urban policy, natural resource management, flood management, disaster resilient infrastructure, and community development. Prior to CDRI, at the Atlantic Council and previously at Resilient Cities Network, Mr. Prothi has engaged directly with cities, national governments, private sector partners, funders and technical experts to mainstream the understanding of resilience and sustainability in development priorities. I request Mr. Amit Prothi for the opening remarks to set the tone for the webinar. Over to you, Amit. Thank you, Suchismita. Um, thank you for that introduction and hello to all of my fellow participants. Uh, and people who are listening in today. Um, you know, the topic we're talking about is nothing new. I think we, we are hearing a lot of um, buzz. If you look at LinkedIn, if you look at newspapers, if you look at what's happening in New York, in UNGA this week, lots and lots of people are talking about how mangroves can help protect against coastal erosion and support biodiversity. Trees and vegetation in urban areas can help to reduce temperature and can offer a respite from extreme heat. Large forested areas can contribute towards carbon sequestration and help to reduce greenhouse gas, gases in the atmosphere. These types of interventions, um, you know, some people call it new, some people don't call it new. There's a lot of discussion around this particular topic of nature-based solutions. Um, as the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, it is really our intention to promote practices that can help to reduce risks related to climate change and other natural hazards. So in that context, I think it is really important for us to talk about this topic um, and have a position on it. We've started to define our position in a global flagship report, a annual report that will come out on the state of global resilient infrastructure um, next year that we'll be launching, launching at G20. We'll have a position paper on nature-based solutions there. We're also trying to highlight this important topic in our annual flagship conference, the International Conference for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. Interestingly, today is exactly three years from the time when CDRI was actually announced by the Prime Minister of India at the UN summit in 2019. That's where CDRI was launched. So I'm really actually excited that we are starting our DRI series, the three part DRI series on our foundation day. Uh, so first of all, you know, happy foundation day to all of my colleagues, but also to others who are interested in seeing what's going on with CDRI. Three, three years since we were announced, we are moving ahead. Um, and I also want to acknowledge the partnership with UNEP today, uh, who are also commote, uh, committed to promoting NBS. Um, where, you know, we, we, I'm glad that we are joining together to actually take this topic forward. This three-part DRI dialogue, series on implementing nature-based solutions for climate and disaster resilient infrastructure. It's really an opportunity for stakeholders to understand what are the challenges and opportunities for investing in nature-based solutions as part of a larger resilient infrastructure narrative. The expected outcomes are to promote greater awareness of existing knowledge. You know, we are not new in this topic. Lots of others are doing work in this space. So, you know, how do we collectively raise knowledge um, based on existing, but also new knowledge that can be created in this space? Um, raise awareness on what might be the gaps. You know, it's people are talking about it, but there are also clearly very, a lot of gaps in this particular space. So how can we address those gaps as part of our agendas as UNEP, as uh, CDRI and other actors. 
And it's really to start supporting a global community of practice, you know, in the public and private uh, sector, amongst public and private sector actors for implementing NBS for resident as part of resident infrastructure. With that introduction, I will hand this back to Suchismita, and I'm here really keenly listening to what all, all of the partners, uh, speakers are going to say today. So back to you, Suchismita. Thank you so much, Amit, for uh, the insightful introduction. Um, and happy foundation day to you too. Uh, we will now dive straight into three presentations uh, that will provide insights on case studies that have integrated research policy standards and benchmarking design guidance in the implementation of NBS for infrastructure projects, uh, mainly with, with the intention also to unlock and attract more private sector investments in this space. Uh, we will take questions from participants after the conclusion of the presentations. Uh, please put your questions in the Q&A section and do mention the expert to whom the question is addressed. May I uh, invite our first expert, Ms. Emily Corwin, for a context setting presentation on nature-based solutions for climate and disaster resilient infrastructure. Ms. Emily Corwin is the Director of Nature-Based Engineering Solutions at Conservation International, a registered professional civil engineer in the state of California, and the founder of an environmental engineering firm that focuses on water resource and conservation projects. At Conservation International, Emily works to create the science, solutions, partnerships, and field examples needed to bring an innovative green gray infrastructure approach to the world's most vulnerable communities. She currently leads a global gray green community of practice and is a member of the Natural Infrastructure Initiative and the American Society of Civil Engineers Committee on Natural and Nature-Based Infrastructure Systems. Oh, Great, thank you so much for those um, introductions and um, for hosting to CDRI for your foundation day and for hosting this three day webinar or three series webinar um, set. So it's my pleasure to start with an overview um, of nature-based solutions for climate and disaster resilient infrastructure. And as many of you no, we live in an era of ever increasing weather and climate disasters. And by 2050, nearly 20% 20 of the world's population will be at risk of floods. Also by 2050, up to 5.7 billion people will live in water scarce areas. And simultaneously nature is declining at unprecedented rates and species extinctions continue to accelerate which threatens the functioning of ecosystems. Ecosystems that human livelihoods, economies, food security, and much more depend upon. So as the pressure to adapt increases, infrastructure costs and investments are expected to equal 80% of total climate change adaptation spending globally. This is estimated at 150 to 450 billion US dollars per year by 2050. And there's increasing demand for engineers and contractors to deliver sustainable and resilient infrastructure. So conventional gray infrastructure is responsible for over 60% of global carbon emissions. It's generally inflexible in its ability to adapt to changing climate conditions, and it can exacerbate species and habitat loss. So in a review of hundreds of nature-based infrastructure projects, the International Institute for Sustainable Development calculated that nature-based infrastructure can be up to 50% cheaper than traditional gray infrastructure and provide 28% better value for money. So they estimate that replacing just 11% of current global infrastructure needs with nature-based infrastructure could save almost 250 billion US dollars each year. So what does the term nature-based infrastructure mean? There are a lot of terms you might, have, might see or hear that have subtle nuances or differences between them, but a very similar or overlapping intent. Nature-based features, natural infrastructure, nature-positive infrastructure, ecological restoration, ecosystem-based adaptation, ecosystem disaster risk reduction, ecological adaptation, building with nature, engineering with nature, and green gray infrastructure. In my experience, these are all types of nature-based solutions. 
And the most accepted nature-based solution definition comes from IUCN. And that is that nature-based solutions are actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural and modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively, while simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So just this week, I reviewed a paper from UNEP, um, their Sustainable Infrastructure Program, that I think did an excellent job of defining the function of nature-based infrastructure in that they can deliver the service or function as infrastructure in their own right. They can enhance the functioning or resilience of other infrastructure. They can protect engineered infrastructure assets from climate impacts such as flooding or high winds. They can also boost the functioning and health of infrastructure sector workers, for example, by increasing access to nature, which increases mental well being, which can lead to increased productivity and reduced work absences. And finally, nature based infrastructure can deliver a range of social, environmental, and economic co benefits like carbon capture, enhanced tourism, and increased biodiversity. So pragmatically, there are a range of potential solutions that we can use to address our climate challenges. In our most built environments, a great only solution like seawalls may be most appropriate. And on the other end of the spectrum, a purely green solution like mangrove restoration may be best. So one type of nature-based infrastructure we're working to advance at Conservation International is green-gray infrastructure, which draws upon the best of our engineering achievements to create hybrid solutions along this spectrum. So what is green-gray infrastructure? It's the combination of conserving and restoring ecosystems with the selective use of conventional engineering approaches to provide people with solutions that deliver climate change resilience and adaptation benefits. And this is a photo from the country of Guyana where mangroves have been restored and conserved in front of a seawall that has been strengthened, strengthened. And those two elements, the green and the gray, are working together to complement each other to reduce the risk and exposure of communities along the coast to sea level rise and storm surge. So another coastal example, this is a photo from the Philippines, combines coral reef conservation through a marine protected area that's offshore, mangrove restoration, and rock breakwaters for coastal protection. A freshwater example, this is from the United States in a, the city of Sacramento in California is combining floodplain restoration, levee construction, and modified infrastructure, in this case, highways and railways, to manage riparian flooding and restore ecosystem function. We can also improve water security and improve the resilience of commu communities using nature-based infrastructure. For example, by reforesting and conserving forests that reduce sedimentation, which can make water cleaner and cheaper for downstream water treatment plants to clean for communities to drink, and which can regulate flows to downstream hydropower plants and for agricultural users. Collecting and using rainwater from roof surfaces or other above ground surfaces is a practice that has been employed by communities for centuries and today is becoming more common as people seek ways to increase local resilience and use water resources more efficiently. We can improve water quality using nature-based infrastructure by constructing water quality wetlands that use natural processes, processes to clean stormwater, gray water, or wastewater, resulting in improved habitat and enhanced biodiversity. We can also enable and promote climate smart aquaculture that simultaneously sustainably intensifies production while restoring ecosystems, the clean water before it leaves production ponds. We can reduce flood risk using nature-based infrastructure by integrating ecosystem restoration or conservation with traditional levee design, 
to achieve greater protection from floods and sea level rise than if either solution was applied alone. And we can restore river floodplains by building terraced levees that reduce flooding, create habitats, improve water quality, and provide access for people. So one of the things that gives me hope for the future is all the ways that nature-based infrastructure can integrate across a landscape and our communities to increase our resilience and enable us to adapt in our changing climate. I look forward to the coming speakers um, who I think will share more specific nature-based infrastructure case studies and finance strategies. So thanks so much for the opportunity to provide this overview and I'll um, look for questions in the chat. So much, Emily, uh, for this very comprehensive overview of the concept and its, its applications on on the ground. And uh, I think uh, the uh, upcoming case studies will basically strengthen this and give people an idea about um, how this really works and what is possible on the ground. Um, we will request our participants to um, access the link that was posted earlier. Um, and may I request uh, Saida from UNEP to kindly post it once again, and if they would like a certificate from this uh, learning series. They would have to attempt this questionnaire. Uh, if you can take a few minutes to answer a few set of questions that we have there. And we'll just uh, take a pause of about a minute or so to give you some time to access the link and answer the questions. And while we do that, um, in the next couple of case studies, like, as I said, uh, we will try and demonstrate practical application of NBS in infrastructure development and planning. Uh, this will help get insights on the potential of NBS to complement, substitute, and safeguard the infrastructure. Um, we will, I will invite Ms. Katrina Zushilo, Human Settlements and Infrastructure Senior Specialist from the Green Climate Fund, uh, to make her presentation. Katrina has over 20 years of experience in structuring and delivering sustainable solutions financed by multilateral development banks, developing institutions, and co-financed by private sector in areas of energy, transport, integrated urban infrastructure, anti-flooding infrastructure, waste management, innovation, and technology transfer. Currently, Katrina leads climate resilient infrastructure result area at the GCF, shaping innovative methodologies for informed decisions to replace hard infrastructure with green solutions systems-based approach to creation of bankable projects and incorporation of climate resilient lens to projects in different sectors. We look forward to your very interesting presentation on the creation of a methodology for climate resilient infrastructure investments with the use of nature-based solutions. Over to you, Katrina, you have 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I would just like to confirm that you can hear me and you can see the presentation. Yes, we can see the presentation and uh, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm just thinking, I'm sorry, just to move the presentation. Um, yeah, can, can you tell me where to move the presentation? I'm sorry, it wasn't possible to use it before. Okay, now I'm done. So um, before I go to uh, to details about the, the project, uh, just very quickly to tell you um, how we uh, how we are organized as Green Climate Fund and what are the main goals for us to achieve this organization. So uh, one of the key aspects that might differ us from many other financial partners is that we look at climate angle as the starting point for projects. So uh, we really want to see what are the climate problems um, and how the project is going to tackle climate issues, both from the perspective of adaptation and mitigation. Um, all the developmental aspects that are necessary to achieve climate goals are very important for us as well, uh, but the starting point is on climate. Uh, we work with the uh, eight main result areas, and as you can see, we have a lot of infrastructure as well as ecosystem, nature-based solutions within our um, approach, um, so we can blend and think about joint solutions. 
Um, if you look at uh, what we do, we are not much different from other financial partners. So we actually promote um, development with the specific technical assistance windows, um, uh, development of uh, integrated uh, approach to climate uh, through country programming, uh, through um, adaptation plans, and also preparation of um, entities that work in the countries uh, to capacitate them uh, to bring climate projects. But we also have a specific technical assistance for project preparation and finally for, um, uh, for project delivery. Uh, now, if you look at um, what we do uh, in Jamaica, um, the first thing maybe to say is that we are, uh, we were asking uh, ourselves a question, how to speed up the process of use of nature-based solutions uh, within infrastructure, hard infrastructure environment. Um, and as it was uh, presented by my predecessor, there are many examples, but it's still not very much in the um, in the design phase of those that uh, that propose projects uh, for infrastructure to think about nature-based solutions straightforward. If we look from the industry perspective, those are really two separate flows. Uh, therefore, it's very difficult to convince hard infrastructure engineers to embrace nature-based solution in their thinking. Um, so the first goal we wanted to achieve is really to maybe not to make another example of project, but to really think how to develop the methodology that can then be used anywhere um, to, to promote uh, this, this integrated approach. Um, so the salary for, for developing this methodology is it's quite a few stakeholders that work together. So first and foremost, we have Jamaica government that agreed to host uh, the pilot. Um, and we are very thankful because uh, they really work hand in hand with us. So it's not just um, an assignment to an external partner. Jamaica government is with us through the whole journey, which of course it may take a little bit more time, but then there is a real ownership behind it. Uh, the, uh, the organization that launched and conceptualized um, the whole idea was Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment. This is another coalition I know also closely working with CDRI uh, that was launched exactly at the same time three years ago. Uh, so the first phase uh, that we are developing with the Jamaica pilot is uh, led by UK government. Um, and in practice is being uh, developed by Oxford University. Uh, and this phase was devoted into systemic climate risk assessment tool. Um, this tool was uh, designed to, to go systemically from the climate hazards um, that are hampering um, uh, services of infrastructure in the country. Um, through the process of vulnerability assessment up to the uh, informed decision where the hotspots in the infrastructure systems exist. Starting from that point, uh, we have just started the second phase, which is green climate, finance, uh, green climate found uh, financed and implemented, uh, which is actually looking for, um, for use of nature-based solutions and hard infrastructure um, projects creation. Uh, now, what we hope is that this approach will really uh, demonstrate how project concepts can be derived from climate rationale and not from developmental aspects. And secondly, um, to be to assure that at the right moment of project conceptualization, the thinking about nature-based solution comes. Um, so what we expect to achieve is that uh, within the outputs of our methodology, we will be able to promote, but also to, to develop uh, first pilots of technically, technically operationally and financially viable concepts of projects. Um, what we are also heading to achieve is to check these concepts with potential financial partners so that we can really get informed information about how they perceive 
still the risks of nature-based solution to be implemented instead of hard infrastructure, and also overall um, a climate uncertainty approach that we will be trying to, uh, to tackle within this project. Um, if we look at the main drivers, just to summarize what I already said, maybe in the more systematic way, uh, we start from climate rational. So all uh, climate hazards that exist in Jamaica are being mapped uh, to the level of site specific. So we can understand what are the most common and the most dangerous multi-hazard situation at the hotspots where infrastructure can or is very often broken uh, the most often and where it can, it can bring uh, the systemic failure to the systems of infrastructure. Uh, then uh, the analysis are being done again on the systemic level uh, so that we look at the systems, for example, for water, energy, infrastructure, and intersection of these infrastructures uh, to be sure that, that if we promote nature-based solution, it really brings a tangible result to avoid the situation that also nature-based solution can be perfectly uh, well-designed solution, but because it was only asset design, just looking at the small spectrum of, uh, of the infrastructure, still the systemic interconnection uh, would result in failure because not all the system is being approached. Uh, at that stage, we want to incorporate already thinking about nature-based solutions. That's why within the JSRAT tool developed by Oxford, we can see the intersection maps of nature-based solution also with information about its quality um, and where it's actually uh, matching the hotspots for uh, systems of infrastructure. And as I said, out of this exercise, we would like to develop the methodology that gives uh, really the projects that are technically and financially viable, uh, blending both uh, green and gray infrastructure. Uh, now, as I said at the beginning, we want to develop something that, that is not just another example, but maybe can, can produce multiple projects within different jurisdictions. Uh, that's why the methodology is going to be replicable. That's why it's methodology. Uh, so we will be showing a step by step what to do uh, and how to gather information uh, and data on the ground to, to develop and replicate it whenever and whatever country uh, would need that and, and be interested to do that. Secondly, it's scalable. It's scalable in two dimensions. Firstly, uh, it can be used for integrated urban project, um, as, as presented before. The last slides of my predecessor were showing very well how it's working in the integrated manner, and it can be captured by this methodology producing the integrated project pipeline. But it's also scalable in the sense that, that you can produce the first uh, most important projects out of the methodology. You may start implementation, you may mobilize more finance, more interest, and then using this, you can spread it to, to more projects and scale up in this way. Uh, now it's adaptable in the sense that it really enables to understand what kind of information is needed at which step, um, and then tailor-made uh, feasibilities and data gathering can happen um, within use of this methodology, um, having that in front of you uh, while uh, being a project promoter. And finally, uh, we will have this final stage of market assessment discussing with, with financial partners. Uh, now, the final slide shows uh, how, how we work. So it's really the presentation of the flow of our work. So we have the first stage with vulnerability analysis and definition and uh, characteristics of nature-based solution and hard infrastructure vis-a-vis multi-hazard uh, climate changes that are visible from the JSRAT tool. And now what we started now is, uh, is um, selecting the most um, promising hotspots interventions in which we can see surrounding nature-based solutions so that we can assure that our solutions will be hybrid. 
Um, and we will select three of them. Uh, the selection will go through the through the uh, workshop with the Jamaican government, so so they can be really in the driving seat to decide. Um, and then at stage three, we will actually prepare the advanced concepts of these three interventions, um, where uh, we will look at the systemic approach uh, in it. We will look at how nature-based solution can can be sustainable solution and can actually replace or um, secure existing hard infrastructure. There will be a technical feasibility study uh, brought into this concept, and the technical feasibility is going into the details that will enable us a uh, financial structure of CAPEX and OPEX, so both capital and operational costs. Why it's so important is because to convince a hard infrastructure industry to look at nature-based solution, the first question is how much it's going to cost. Uh, so we really need to, to show in numbers uh, that it can be very feasible option for, uh, for industry and that it can really bring effects uh, on the cash flow analysis. And finally, we will be checking operational and governance settings. So also informing Jamaica government if there is any missing regulation, if there needs to be any special, um, let's say, building codes change so that this, this can be properly implemented. There can also be the element of, of planning, uh, of spatial planning that will allow to protect nature-based solutions that will be selected to protect hard infrastructure. And finally, as I said, we will sit with financial partners, potential financing partners, both local and international, and ask them, would you finance projects that are structured this way? And having this uh, confirmation, we will be able to, to say in a more open space that, yes, this methodology can work to crowd in more funds. This is all from me for the moment, so thank you very much. Thank you, Katrina, for uh, this presentation. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting case study and very interesting work that has been done, and I'm sure there will be questions on this. Uh, we will take up all the questions after the next presentation by uh, Mr. D.K. Nag, and we'll take questions for uh, Emily's presentation, Katrina's presentation, and Mr. D.K. Nag's presentation in one go. So the next presentation we have is on the application of soil bioengineering for infrastructure development from the state of Himachal Pradesh in India. Bioengineering is a subset of green infrastructure that uses vegetation to serve as engineering function. The most common uses include soil surface protection against erosion, soil stabilization, improved drainage functions, etc. I now invite Mr. D.K. Nag, um, environmental engineer with over 28 years of professional experience in design and construction and supervision of various road and infrastructure projects uh, to share his expertise. Mr. Nag provides specialist environmental um, expertise to act as technical authority and focal point for matters related to protection of environment in the design, engineering, and construction activities. Um, he also contributes to environmental safeguards and standards related work. Mr. Nag has been instrumental in the publication of specifications for bioengineering in slopes, stabilization, and protection, and in preparing rate analysis and specifications for schedule of rates for the Himachal Pradesh Public Works Department. Mr. Nag, over to you. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Sushmita. Are you able to view my presentation? Yes, you might want to put it in slideshow mode. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. First of all, uh, I really uh, I have gone through. Uh, was listening my predecessors. They have given a very detail about this uh, um, disasters and problem. How to go for the natural way solution. So this this is really uh, the important because I'm focusing now specifically what uh, what we did in the state. So uh, because we realized in the 2006-4-5 when we were developing infrastructure and I'm associated with the infrastructure department. So, uh, and uh, situated in the uh, 
uh, Himalayas and fragile ecology that we uh, realize that a lot of maintenance issues are arising because of this uh, um, non resilient of infrastructure and uh, costing as one of my professors said that 50 percent cost was also is a uh, cheaper for the uh, natural based solutions so then we switch over to this and a lot of work was done with, with the help of some um, horticulture department some expertise with the world bank association also so the first first thing that the we uh, because uh, young growing mountain fragile geology and faulty practices sum up um, every uh, uh, every effort to minimize the erosion and slope stability was the biggest issue. And in hills, uh, debris issues, then uh, uh, falling in the uh, sixth zone, the earthquakes and all these issues were very, very um, uh, bothering to the uh, engineers that how we can go, how we can reduce the uh, cost of the construction, how we can uh, reduce the maintenance uh, and uh, uh, the structure should be um, resilient to the climate changes. So that's why we tried so many techniques. So one of the best techniques at which we uh, were successful and uh, uh, rapidly we are using and we are following in uh, all kind of road constructions, uh, maybe in the rural roads or then uh, uh, national highways or uh, state highways, uh, uh, that is the, that is what we, uh, I'll show you this. So this uh, one picture which uh, uh, I'm sharing with, this is a rugged mountain. You can see that how uh, natural disasters are playing havoc with the nature. I mean, disaster, um, and it's a very difficult. You are, now you see, you can see there's no road. And uh, it is difficult for the engineer for where to start, how to start. Now, firstly, he should go for the clearances, then go for the protection work, then go for the um, maintaining the passage for the uh, stakeholders. So this, these, uh, these were the issues and uh, vulnerable landslide, debris, soil erosions and other mass wasting things were happening. So now this is again uh, one of the pictures that uh, we took uh, during the cloud burst um, monsoon and because of the heavy rain, torrential rains and how the road, you can see that no road is visible, no bridges uh, uh, visible in the because of this uh, happening so then we we thought that the only solution which can help or which we can go for that is the natural based solutions that this is the same soil where we are working because ultimately it is the soils uh, earth on where we are constructing any infrastructure and if soil is a resistance I mean, if soil friendly material we use soil uh, friendly technology we used only then we can be long sustainable solutions we can have otherwise uh, whatever uh, being a civil engineer my practices and uh, many times we found that retaining wall retaining structures cc structures all these structures having a heavy moss got failed so the, that that was the reason so now you can see there's another uh, one uh, uh, road uh, highway structure that uh, how these uh, rails you can see from this how uh, the torrential rain is causing and even existing structures are being damaged due to this um, uh, gully formation after the first or second torrential rains happened generally uh, northern part of the country and especially in India so that that was the why these uh, issues uh, were uh, rake up. So then we, first of all, in the beginning, we found that we should pick up the material which is available in the vice netting. So like uh, the here, you can see that the bamboo crib wall construction. So this was the soil bioengineering and uh, how we can go for slope stabilization. The reason was why we picked up the same material as uh, uh, all of us, those my viewers can um, uh, really appreciate that. Uh, Soil will definitely accept uh, the local material, local vegetation as faster than as compared to the foreign materials or foreign vegetations or anything that, that we are bringing to that uh, periphery. So then we found that this uh, soil uh, bamboos are available and bamboo, the temperature uh, is uh, very conducive to go for that. So then we started this bamboo crib wall construction. Instead of going for uh, RCC wall and crib wall, um, uh, CC walls or uh, uh, retain um, um, this um, um, brick walls. 
So we went for the bamboo pave wall construction. Protection, I mean, that can stabilize our slope progress. I mean, the work where the upper side. So now very clearly that you can see how we uh, very, without any um, application of very um, complicated engineering, we, we were not supposed to apply very complicated engineering so that uh, the worker, those who are at site, the engineer, those who are uh, uh, supervising these works can follow the practice very easily. And it should, first of all, as I said earlier, it should be adaptable for the soil, local soil. But uh, before that, the any technology or any technique which we want to implement, that should be acceptable and adaptable to the engineers, to the supervisors, to the pupils, those who are to uh, those who are there to execute, those who are there to supervise, they are the custodian. So until unless they will not be friendly, they will not accept, they may put some resistance or they may put different and you will not be able to go for the natural base solution. So that was one of the reasons that uh, this could have helped that even a local laborer, local people, I mean, you can employ them and uh, without any application of a certain very heavy technology, you can tell them what they are doing since their um, upbringings, like they have been born and brought up in these places so they can understand, they have seen the uh, growing of uh, these uh, species this way. And so that was uh, easy for us to convince them to our engineers, to our uh, uh, supervisors and then simultaneously for our the actual laborers, those who were working on the site. So these were the kind of demonstrations. So now you can see the gullies need to, how to arrest the gullies. That was the biggest issue because until unless you will not arrest the gullies because in um, presence of the, after the torrential rains and not only of the torrential rains, but uh, because of the sudden wide range of temperatures, the rise in temperatures, um, immediately the temperature is up, some, immediately the temperature is going down. So because of all these reasons and uh, uh, torrential rains are there, so gullies need to be arrested. So these small, small things, the very small, small things, uh, I, I, I think even uh, sometime, even in a big projects, even engineers overlook these small, small things that we started to um, um, notice them and to plug these issues. So this was like, this is one of the examples. So uh, this, you can see that some all way where we use this, this is we use the grip walls and uh, um, uh, benching off with the same material which was available in that area or in that same slip. So backfilling and trimming to be done for these kind of things. So now, now, now that this, these are the effects. So this, this photograph is, uh, you can see this first one is, that was the initially from the left side. Now the next one is again after 10, 10 15 days. So you, you are able to see some difference in uh, vegetations, which is uh, working itself. There's no need to explanation that how plantation, how plants protect the soil and how st stabilize the st slopes. So the, that this, if you find this kind of vegetation, you are uh, able to find so you can um, ably understand that uh, this is going to be protected. So this 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 is the way that how we did very small way that there is no I um, mean simply the laborers were deployed and now again now here in next this slide uh, why I'm uh, concentrating on this uh, again specifically here we used not only bamboo but the other different material which is locally available material. Not that when the first slide we I showed that how uh, we found that bamboos were available there. So then we found that bamboo could help because that is very much in the atmosphere. So here we found that there's a panumia which is uh, available in that um, uh, vice netty. We cut those uh, trees, um, I mean branches, and started uh, the way engineering way. We uh, decided that we should go for this like this way that how we are going to um, uh, stabilize these uh, slopes and how these are helping and very, um, very, very simple way. There is no hard fast technology and moreover, very cheaper because the, there is no material cost. Only the cost is labor cost and labor cost is also not, you don't require very skilled labor. You can have an unskilled laborer from the surrounding areas. 
so this way you 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 can save the things or some of the case studies of the these uh, photographs which i am showing as of a different road structures um, playing there so how this is uh, coming up um, i mean you can uh, very well so this was again a, one of the very tedious site of when we were working with the world bank one of the projects of uh, um, upgradation of the highway and it was uh, uh, like a very heavy sliding and um, in the downfall there was a river passage and it was obstructing the river as well as uh, uh, upper side uh, there was a road passage which was going on so then then again we had a lot of uh, discussion on this issue and we went for the same and started small small plantation like this way so how we can save the existing infrastructure of uh, that is road and how we can stabilize for further and to stop the uh, maintenance day to day maintenance and reduce the cost of the project also so this how so this you can see uh, after 3 months or 2 months the uh, totally green area and it is a safety for the infrastructure which we had already constructed with a lot of uh, money deposited on this and river although it was a dry at the time when this uh, pic was taken uh, but you can see that uh, it can save uh, otherwise and um, stop polluting the um, river passage so this way this again after 6 month we again we were uh, observing this site that how it is behaving and how it is affecting this natural based solution because this why, why this is natural based solution that because we 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 uh, we behaved we started we applied our technology as the nature there was applying since ages as we have seen we have taken over from the nature while we constructing our infrastructure so that's why this this is a perfect natural based solution of course there are two three more uh, uh, techniques and uh, um, technologies we are applying in other roads also but here uh, today i am discussing only soil bio engineering so these are the uh, some of the uh, uh, actual work done that you can see now you again see these are the again one of the road passage that uh, was uh, appreciated this because here it was big problem since uh, uh, the inception of the dpr and construction of road and we were not able to find any uh, strong solution because to construct the retaining wall and putting a cc walls and civil structures it was difficult because cost was not allowing the project cost was going very high so avoid the cut the cost as well as maintain the structure and slow down the maintenance value so this is again how this road and uh, become safe so these uh, are the some of the five six uh, uh, case studies that uh, i am sharing with you of uh, i mean actual things we did i mean like this is a huge uh, retaining wall structures constructed if you will not save the structure at any time during the uh, disaster or during the climate change torrential rains or you may have a damage to these uh, wall so that's why we started uh, doing all the same thing in the second pick also and third one and like this way all these at a different places that you can see that how we did all these things and so finally i mean uh, this is these are the uh, the advantage that we concluded labor intensive nature of soil because uh, we are providing jobs to the unskilled laborers and without application of very complicated technology and employment to the local people and sustainable technology which is friendly to the soil and the nature biosynthetic and indigenous material indigenous material mean i mean the material not specified by any book or the materials which are not specified by any engineering specifications but which are available uh, at the places where uh, we are working low capital cost as uh, emily has also um, said in her presentation that uh, uh, these natural based solutions can reduce 50% cost from the way the things to the now is going on so this was uh, also low capital cost compared to engineering structures and possibility of the local population management and maintenance 
so this is again a very very important aspect that uh, until unless you will not uh, involve the stakeholders and stakeholders not only those those who are flying the uh, vehicles on those roads but uh, stakeholders those those who are staying in the vicinity they are more vulnerable to this kind of disasters because anything happens it is always pressure on them they are also part of uh, uh, that uh, problem uh, they may be called their their day to day affair may be stopped so we we involved them also so that was also helping and people appreciated this so this is again a brush layering that again we uh, as we succeeded and we found that this is a very successful so we uh, gone further develop that um, with the simple technology sometime bamboo layer brush layering palisade walls so we named in our specifications also that how we can go so, um, with different manners these are again some of the live examples that you can see how we did the work and uh, on um, to safeguard and how the people are involved very in a simple way there is no uh, very um, skilled technology is a very simple way even a unskilled people locally available uh, material as well as locally available laborer they, those, those who can join to us and uh, can solve our problems and they better understand the nature uh, than the person who is coming from outside for looking after and presenting and supervising the thing so these were the some of the roads that uh, you can see that how this is nowadays i mean because of this soil bioengineering these are the some of the examples that you can see for example like you can Mr. see now uh, miss nag sorry to interrupt uh, uh, can we wind up in about a minute or so yes can yes, yes. I'm just i'm yes i'm finished so you, these are again you. one of that uh, uh, hydro shading we are using so this is what natural way solutions for uh, resilient infrastructure thank you very much thank you so much thank you for providing an overview of this practical application on the ground application of bioengineering um we can take a few questions um actually i do see that emily and katrina have answered some of the questions that uh, that were posed for them but um i think if we can request emily to just talk talk us through some of these uh, you know very interesting answers that she has provided to the questions there is one question which uh, basically talks about the uncertainty of vegetation so the uncertainty attached to nature based solutions and how does um, an engineer get the confidence that you know when they move from gray to uh, gray infrastructure to green infrastructure how do they get the confidence to really you know apply these solutions given the uncertainty emily would you like to answer that question yeah it's such a good question and i think it's it's one of the question, one of the challenges that we face around the world, especially in the engineering community, where we have trusted solutions that we've gone to for millennia that are these conventional gray infrastructure solutions. And this is something new for many, most in the engineering community to now be designing and building with nature. And we, just quite honestly don't have the database of monitoring results that document, for example, how mangroves work alongside seawalls to reduce wave heights and meet certain performance objectives. Or as a, we don't, we have the monitoring data, we can make predictions based on what we have, but we don't have the same um, you know, hundreds of years of documented evidence for how those two things perform together. And so one thing that I think is really important as many of you move on to identify and develop nature-based infrastructure solutions is developing these as designed experiments in a way where monitoring is incorporated from the design of the project so that we all know that we need to document the results so that we can share those, combine it with others around the world who are doing similar things and start to build our confidence as an engineering community 
and the kind of robust data set that we need to, um, to, to verify how these um, combinations of green and gray work together. That said, there are, we have enough information to begin. Um, and there's engineering resources that are available and best practice for how to combine green and gray and work with, with, um, with ecosystems. A couple of things I particularly want to point out is that ecosystems, especially if they're restored and you're doing ecological restoration, which would be kind of a natural, um, kind of not, not necessarily planting, but you're waiting for seeds to come in and for the ecosystems to flourish, um, that takes time. Even if you do planting and kind of accelerate that process, that can be three, five, 10, maybe 20 years until an ecosystem reaches its full potential of risk reduction. So I use, I work a lot with mangroves at Conservation International. And so imagine the, the root structures of those mangroves. And that's something that has incredible wave reduction potential, but not when they're seedlings or saplings. And so there's an upfront investment of monitoring and maintenance and adaptive management that needs to be incorporated into your design and implementation of nature-based solutions. So that might sound like a lot of work, I get it, but the long-term benefit is large. So our conventional infrastructure might have a lifetime of 20, 30, 50 years. Ecosystems could function and continue to adapt to our changing climate indefinitely. And once we invest that upfront energy and time to establish them in a sustainable way, then we will, the, the maintenance then actually decreases as compared to our conventional systems. That was a long, a long answer, but I think I, I touched on a couple of the different questions there um, around green and gray and kind of building our engineering confidence. Thank you, Emily. Uh, very insightful and a lot of food for thought there. Um, there was a question for Katrina, which you've already answered, but maybe for the benefit of the other participants here. And a very important question also in terms of how do we engage the local voices? How do we engage stakeholders uh, in the pre-planning and designing phase? And from the example of the Jamaica pilot, uh, how, did, how did basically GCF address this issue? Katrina, over to you. So I think this case is that we are not addressing the issue because this is just happening from the beginning. Uh, and this is how, how this project and governance is structured. So there is a full country ownership and it was also the work of, of Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment. They were looking for a country that is ready to invest also their time and engagement with stakeholders to, to do the process but also to take an ownership after the process. So um, that's why I see already within the first phase that there is a huge difference because now is the moment when it's already handed over the, the tool that is developed and, um, and country becomes independent. So there's no problem of the capacity in the future because they, they are really embracing the capacity that is that is given, not as just one assignment, technical assessment that as often happens, external experts are doing, but then they leave and nothing stays there. Um, and also um, at every stage, we have stakeholders involved from the sense of outside of the government. So for um, Oxford University part, it was more the, the, those that are able to model, those university involved, um, and uh, organizations and government that is responsible for, for data gathering and, and data uh, modeling. So they are taking over the, the tool. Now we will be more working with, uh, with parishes as well, with, uh, with local uh, stakeholders to see what can work, what is really on the ground. And, uh, and yeah, and what is the most important is that at every step, there is a decision-making and the workshop in which 
the government of Jamaica with the relevant stakeholders, they say, yes, we can take it. Yes, it will work for us. Uh, and definitely there are a lot of cases in which they said, okay, we have indigenous solutions or for example, for this kind of stabilization um, of let's say electricity potty poles, we have the best solution that is in the wood, uh, wooden solution. And, and this is what we know that is going to work. So we, we are also getting a lot of feedback and they, they know the best very often what can work. So then we focus on things which are missing. So that's more or less how it works. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Nag, uh, there is a question for you, uh, which says, is there any recommendation on the specific vegetation to strengthen slope, slope stability? Uh, you're on mute. So now you're on mute. Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself. Uh, no, uh, because there's no specific material to be used because if you will start using specific material, then it will not be a natural based solution. You have to go uh, the material which is available in the surrounding and the material which we are using for the slope stabilization is a small species which are available, which you can see there in the 50, 100 meter surrounding of that area. So that was the beauty of uh, this uh, soil bioengineering. Only then it can be sustainable. If we, will, if we will try to bring the foreign materials that may not be sustainable, that may take much time to get along with this the soil and soil may be, then we require to study the soil differently and material differently. So that's why we don't require to study the soil differently and the material differently. So we, we should go for the local materials. Right. Thank you so much, Krishna. Thank you. Um, we can now uh, move to the final section. Uh, we will have some more time for Q&A towards the end. But uh, we now move to the last section where um, my colleague Swapnil will put forth some of the challenges and opportunities for mainstreaming NBS for resilient infrastructure, drawing from the ongoing work um, on CDRI's global flagship report. Uh, Swapnil is an ar architect and urban planner currently on secondment from her role as a research associate at UNDP uh, to CDRI for its biennial report on global infrastructure resilience. At CDRI, she anchors the project's thematic track on NBS and coordinates the project's global infrastructure resilience survey to capture the perspectives of experts and users on infrastructure management and governance. Previously at India's uh, National Institute of Urban Affairs, she led knowledge capitalization and capacity building for a national urban development program funded by EU and AFD. And as she continues to learn more about the intricacies of urban development, uh, she has slowly moved towards focusing on this restoring ecological harmony in urban areas. Swapnil, over to you. Thanks, Suchasmita. Uh, could you please confirm if you can hear me well and if my presentation is visible? Yes, Swapnil. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. I'm pleased to join this discussion. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for, you know, uh, your interest in this uh, DRI di dialogue series uh, by CDRI. Today, my presentation will basically build from, you know, the various uh, many elements of the case studies that we have seen. Uh, and, you know, the, the discussions that we've just uh, had in the Q&A section, I would like to really uh, bring focus to the current challenges and opportunities that are posed uh, by nature-based solutions on uh, our path to infrastructure resilience. Uh, our work in the CDRI's uh, global flagship report builds from these challenges and opportunities, and I'll be taking you through some of them. So, um, we are all well aware, and this was also brought uh, up by my fellow panelists uh, today, that climate uh, change challenges infrastructure resilience in different ways. Uh, firstly, as climate means change, weather-related uh, events such as floods, cyclones, heat waves, and droughts, wildfires are becoming more extreme and frequent. Secondly, the uh, exposure of infrastructure assets may increase due to factors such as sea level rise, 
drying, heating, and glacier retreat. And as climate magnifies hazard and exposure, infrastructure disruption will become more frequent, pervasive, and severe. Thirdly, much existing legacy infrastructure, for example, in the power generation sector, it will be phased out as countries transition to carbon neutral economies. This will lead to a growing stock of stranded assets as capital flows to uh, new infrastructure classes. So faced with these multifaceted uh, challenges, uh, which include closing the infrastructure financing gap, strengthening disaster and climate resilience, and uh, transitioning to carbon neutrality, in amidst all this, nature-based solutions have emerged uh, as solutions that have the potential to tackle uh, climate mitigation, adaptation, and also deliver multiple benefits for people and nature. In that context, I would like to draw your attention to some of the challenges uh, and opportunity areas uh, that, uh, you know, that are posed by nature-based solutions and what has to be done to really mainstream, mainstream them into policy and practice today. Uh, I'll start with uh, the opportunity areas. Over the last decade, many UN agencies, uh, the United Nations Environment Program, UNDP, the FAO, as well as other international organizations, uh, Conservation International, IUCN, WWF, all of them have been implementing community-led nature-based approaches to adaptation. Uh, or, you know, ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction projects. And there is emerging ev evidence from these projects that suggests that NBS in certain contexts provide low-cost solutions to many climate change-related impacts and offer key advantages over engineered solutions. In particular, NBS are reported to deliver a wider range of economic uh, ecosystem services, especially to the vulnerable sections of the society, and increasingly their potential to, in some cases, substitute, uh, safeguard, and most importantly, complement grey infrastructure has gained consensus in the global uh, infrastructure community. Some of the potential opportunities uh, that are offered by nature-based solutions, uh, the first one is definitely the cost of their implementation and ONM. The perception at many a time is that because NBS try, you know, really shows impact in the long term, the cost of their implementation and ONM could be, ex you know, uh, could exceed. Uh, the costs of traditional gray infrastructure assets, but in in reality, they may they may have far lower operation and maintenance costs as compared to conventional gray infrastructure systems. For example, it has been estimated that stabilizing slopes or protecting embankments uh, from erosion using vetiver grass costs only a fraction of gray uh, alternatives uh, like. Uh, doing concreting, uh, concrete retaining walls or rock fill uh, gabion walls. NBS has far lower ONM costs also, and when compared to traditional gray infrastructure, and the examples for this could be many. Uh, green roofs may avoid or reduce uh, the need for air conditioning in buildings, etc. The second opportunity, definitely, that NBS offers are uh, in their role in climate change mitigation. The IPCC report, uh, it, it uh, you know, brought out, the, it said that in order to keep the temperature rise close to the Paris Agreement goal of one and a half degrees centigrade, we have to, uh, we must achieve zero CO2 emissions by 2050. And it's really in this context that uh, you know, NBS can provide the best way of delivering solutions, especially because a significant contribution to meeting the uh, targets of the Paris Agreement uh, will be through land-based initiatives. I'll just stop for a quick water break. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. The next opportunity area is 
uh, hazard mitigation, many NBS can effectively complement or replace gray infrastructure. For example, using wetlands and flood retention features to reduce peak flows and storm drainage is something NBS uh, can offer. They have multiple benefits, uh, environmental, social, and economic benefits to offer. They, uh, for example, restored mangroves, not only protect coastlines against storm surge, but also enhance biodiversity and sustain and restore coastal fisheries and their associated livelihoods. Their role in adaptive resilience, they, uh, gray, uh, the gray infrastructure generally has rigid resilience standards that may be challenged by climate-driven changes to hazards and exposure. NBS may be more adaptive with a greater tolerance to changes, uh, something that even Emily mentioned in her response in the Q&A, that NBS, because nature has this innate ability to adapt to climate variabilities, that is the potential that really needs to be, it's an opportunity that needs to be, uh, you know, utilized. NBS also offers the opportunity of integrating traditional technology with cutting edge bioengineering. And there is scope to use bioengineering to develop, test, measure, and perform new nature-inspired materials in NBS technology. And of course, uh, their role in reducing systemic risk to help buffer risk by building greater resilience in infrastructure systems. But despite all the benefits and core benefits that NBS have to offer, uh, all of us are aware that the adoption and upscaling has been limited. And this is particularly uh, stark in the context of low and middle income countries. And there are many reasons. I've tried to list a few here. Uh, they range from data and knowledge gaps to governance uh, challenges, to legislation and regulation and of course financing. Uh, the first uh, challenge that arises under data and knowledge gaps is definitely performance and uncertainties. The body of knowledge regarding NBS has remained largely academic with limited diffusion at the subnational level and this has greatly uh, uh, negatively affected the acceptance of NBS by the public. The lack of comprehensive information regarding the creation implementation and management of NBS projects, as well as the dearth of evidence regarding NBS effectiveness, uh, you know, across different contexts, across various spatial and temporal scales, uh, also causes a great uh, deal of uncertainty, uncertainties. This is something which, you know, emerged from the various case studies in our presentations today as well. The second uh, very pertinent challenge is the lack of skilled and uh, skilled knowledge, technical capacity uh, in the domain. So there is still a lack of scientific synthesis and there are several knowledge gaps in particular around how cost effective NBS can be compared to alternatives. Especially in the global south, there have been a number of studies which mention the lack of knowledge while implementing NBS at scale in the local context. The absence of trans boundary actors, which are skilled in speaking the language of different groups and connecting with stakeholders at different institutional levels also is a critical barrier to their greater uptake. Uh, as for financing, uh, all of us are aware that NBS uh, is a sector which, is st which still remains challenged in, uh, you know, when, when we talk about investments flowing in for NBS projects. Uh, the first reason for that is really the perception around NBS uh, and also that the empirical evidence on, you know, really the cost benefit of NBS projects compared to green infrastructure, the knowledge around that is still inadequate. The, the work is accelerating on that, but that is an area which really needs to speed up cost-benefit analysis, if known to investors, to plan funding for NBS projects will be a major breakthrough. Um, and, you know, more and more of such evidence will help, you know, bring in more trust from investors and from project implementers. 
The difficulties in accessing investments also arise from the absence of national normative frameworks and accepted body of evidence regarding NBS. Uh, it makes uh, it difficult to mobilize public and private investments or to fund technology, services, products uh, in NBS. And this is very closely interrelated to uh, you know, the lack of developed markets for NBS services, technology, and products. Uh, to, uh, to really power the large-scale deployment of NBS, you know, the entire NBS community, and I think, uh, you know, everybody who works in the sector is really advocates for finding the necessary funding and flowing, uh, letting the funds flow at the right places so that uh, there is, you know, a percolation from, you know, these, from all that we advocate for at the international levels to actual on ground implementation at the subnational levels. Uh, and the final uh, issue is definitely around governance, something that will need long term momentum. Uh, typically, uh, NBS, because they need a relatively long time uh, to, prom uh, to produce demonstrated societal benefits, uh, their benefits, their outcomes, uh, you know, are not as tangible as, uh, you know, gray infrastructure projects right at the start of the project itself. Although, uh, you know, awareness has been increasing, there is a lack of sense of urgency regarding the use of NBS, especially in the uh, within the political community and the policy making community. Uh, the issue of standards is something that is very, very stark. Uh, it has gained uh, growing international attention. We have the national, uh, the global standards by the IUCN. Uh, and despite a lot of international momentum around the issue, uh, there has there have been few countries which have adopted NBS into their national norms and standards. Uh, because of this, it really makes it difficult for technical approval and certifications to happen uh, to take place at the local level. Design standards and guidelines for maintaining and monitoring NBS tailored to local conditions of different cities are currently missing. And moreover, innovative NBS solutions may get completely blocked out if there are, you know, if we still continue to stick to rigid uh, norms and standards, uh, which are hundreds of years, many years old and construction standards and planning guidelines, which are outdated. This means that NBS, uh, you know, it can't be ignored and it's a key policy and infrastructure decision. It should be embedded in key policy and decision-making processes, uh, uh, which uh, for, you know, their greater uptake and mainstreaming. Uh, usually multifunctional solutions, um, uh, NBS, NBS are multifunctional solutions. They cross cut between disciplines and institutions and uh, different departments and institutions that uh, often remain uh, you know, disconnected. They have dis distinct visions and goals. Uh, there is you know, uh, discrepancy in legal structures, uh, in ways of thinking that presents a critical challenge to NBS implementation itself. And, by all of this, in a sense, I would just like to say that there is a disconnect between the often short term character of municipal initiatives and the long term investments that NBS require. And of course, how can we forget, you know, the involvement of the communities and the public and how, uh, you know, the lack of public awareness and support uh, can be quite a challenge. Uh, the multiple benefits that NBS have to offer not, you know, def are many a time not clear for citizens, uh, and particularly that is that they are not certain about, you know, what's in it for them, and this kind of uh, certainty requires the provision of incentives like cost sharing or tax uh, uh, tax reductions for owners and developers. So here are some of the challenges and opportunities that you know we are currently researching. Uh, you're doing uh, consultations on to develop the uh, you know thematic chapter of CDRI's global uh, report, flagship report on infrastructure resilience. Uh, I'm I'm pleased to be sharing this platform with Emily and Katerina, who are also partners on the project. Uh, CDRI's biennial report on global infrastructure resilience uh, is 
the first major comprehensive report. It's going to focus attention on the critical and multifaceted challenges posed by disaster and climate resilient infrastructure. And it will be releasing next year in 2023 at India's G20 presidency. The theme for this uh, first edition is nature-based solutions, where you know the focus is really to uh, to examine the role that NBS could play to achieve infrastructure resilience and the different challenges that need to be overcome if they are to achieve scale and widespread adoption. This is a thematic chapter within the report, which has, um, you know, uh, many other outputs, some of them, the, the major output and the key offering of the report is the Global Infrastructure Risk Model and Resilience Index called GIRI uh, as part of, uh, you know, as part of its pillar one and pillar two. Pillar three is the chapter on nature-based solutions. We are also working on progress monitoring towards uh, meeting global goals such as the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. And pillar five is, you know, a thematic deep dive into financing for disaster resilient infrastructure. Uh, as a project, uh, you know, work has really accelerated. We have on board uh, more than 57 experts and more than 21 organizations from, you know, different parts of the world collaborating with us to deliver this really timely and needed product uh, report on global infrastructure resilience. Uh, specifically for NBS, we are partnering with uh, the United States Forest Service as the coordinating lead authors of the chapter on NBS and all the other pioneering organizations in the NBS sector, including UNEP, who are our co-hosts today, the Council on Energy, Environment and Water based in India, Conservation International, Green Climate Fund, Infrastructure Canada, the GCA, Taru Leading Edge and WWF. Um, so here was my, uh, you know, uh, presentation. If you have any feedbacks, questions regarding the flagship report or regarding my, uh, you know, the, the NBS section of the flagship report, please feel free to drop us questions and feedback and you can uh, write to me as well. Uh, here are my details. Thank you and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Swapnil, um, for summarizing the challenges and opportunities from the discussions and from the flagship report so well, I think um, all, of us, all of us have something to take back and think about as we uh, sort of move towards, you know, mainstreaming nature-based solutions. And that is what all of us here are interested in. Um, we are almost um, at the end of uh, the time that was allocated, which is 4.30 p.m. But uh, before, before we move to the closing, uh, may I request the participants to take the uh, post session questionnaire. Uh, Saida, if you could kindly uh, post the link on the chat once again, and if you could take a minute or so to answer the question so that uh, we have the final learning outcomes from after you've heard all the presentations and after you've sort of uh, listened to the various insightful uh, suggestions that our speakers have put forth. And we'll take just about a couple of minutes uh, for the participants to take this survey before we move on and uh, before I invite Saida from the, from the UNEP to, uh, to close this session and conclude with the uh, final remarks. But before I hand over to Saida, I have this very interesting and very relevant uh, comment from one of our participants and uh, which basically says that all our efforts towards conserving biodiversity and towards nature-based solutions are uh, well received are important but what is also important is uh, that we need to change human behavior so at the core of all of this is human behavior and we really need to realize the importance of biodiversity of nature and how we can really integrate this into all of our planning processes and into you know the way we operate uh, with that Saida uh, over to you to conclude the webinar please Thank you. Uh, I shared the link. I think it has not been shared with everyone yet. May I please first ask the Secretariat to share it with everyone? That's it.
Thank you. Sorry, I have some issues with my video. Meanwhile, I think it will give time to the participants to take the survey, please. Okay, it's fine now. Right. Okay, I would like to thank uh, the speakers. Mr. Ahmed Prothi from the Coalition for Disaster Resilience Infrastructure for the opening remarks. Ms. Emily Corwan from Conservation International. Uh, Ms. Katrina Ziamara Zositlo from the GCF Division of Portfolio Management. Mr. Uh, D.K. Nag from Imashal Pradesh Public Works Department of India. Ms. Swapnel Saxena from uh, UNDP for taking time from their busy schedules and sharing with us their experience and insights on nature-based solutions. I also would like to thank the participants for joining this first webinar of the three webinar series on nature-based solutions for resilience infrastructure. Finally, I would like to thank my um, our partner, CDRI, particularly Ms. Sashis Mehta and my colleague, Niha Korean, who have been working hard behind the scenes uh, to make this uh, dialogue series possible. Uh, today, we learned uh, from the various presentations and case studies that uh, private sector engagement is imperative in the implementation of nature-based solutions for resilience and uh, resilient infrastructure, as well as in the reduction of environmental and disaster risks. Nature-based solutions provide better value for money when it comes to infrastructure. So um, a win-win solution for the global community of practice. Investment in uh, nature-based measures by private sector will support the delivery, management, and protection of ecosystem services functioning and will provide benefits to the society as a whole. There are increasing business cases for action on ecosystem services, uh, we learned from the case studies, um, which is emerging within some industries and private sector practitioners as well. Private sector cooperation is required to fully advance the nature-based solutions. Therefore, I think public and private partnership is vital to join efforts for climate and disaster resilient society. We have uh, two more webinars and dialogue series that will provide further clarity on how the private sector could mainstream and incorporate nature-based solutions into their programs and understand how it, provide, it provides socioeconomic and environmental benefits for everyone. The next webinar, uh, I think, will be held on 28th of October. So, Shismita, correct me if, if that's right. The last Friday of October, uh, I think we will we will share a flyer um, with everyone in the coming days. Please register if you would like to, uh, to take a deeper dive into the nature-based solution discussion and learn about the practical application for the private sector. Uh, once again, I would like to thank you all for your participation and engagement in today's webinar. We look forward to seeing you all in the next webinar in October. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to the participants. Uh, look forward to see you for the next webinars as well. Thank you, Saida. Uh, so, Shismita, can you please give a minute or more to the participants to take the survey, please? Sure, sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Katrina.